Our epistle lesson is from Paul's letter to the church at Rome. I believe that um, Cheryl Carson read from a portion of this last week. I'm going to pick up um, from verse 11 um, and read um, from chapter 6, verse 11 into the end of the chapter. Listen for God's word. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin exercise dominion in your mortal bodies to make you obey their passions. No longer present your members to sin as instruments of wickedness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life. And present your members to God as instruments of righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Should we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that you, having once been slaves of sin, have become obedient from the heart to the form of teaching to which you were entrusted, and that you, having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I'm speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to greater and greater iniquity, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness for sanctification. When you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. So what advantage did you then get from the things of which you are now ashamed? The end of those things is death. But now that you have been freed from sin and enslaved to God, the advantage you get is sanctification. The end is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Oh, Lord, we thank you for this rich word that is before us this day. Difficult words that come at us from different directions. But we pray for ears to hear, hearts to receive, minds to to be able to discern what it is that you would have us to know. In Christ we pray. Amen. I read the scripture from Romans, remembering Elizabeth Abel's senior sermon that was just a month ago. Elizabeth worried and worries over next steps after high school and being on her own in college. She worried, but is is excited at the same time. It's a a mixed bag of things. I, I heard this repeated among graduating seniors in my small group at the Montreat Youth Conference in early June. Beginning and ending with excitement and fear, knowing that leaving home brings conflict of choices and values. Elizabeth and these other youth named what was and is true for all of us when we leave home or those safe places that teach us and monitor us right from wrong. We're going to have a hard time staying faithful to what we know is good. We're going to struggle to be faithful to God. And the struggle is true for us, and we don't have to go very far. When worship ends, when we leave this sanctuary, when we go about our afternoons and our weeks and our months. 
It is a struggle to maintain good, to maintain God. Elizabeth named it, but we all know it. On our way to our conference this past week, last uh, week ago Friday, we traveled up through Atlanta to break up the trip because my father and his wife live in Atlanta. We had a nice visit and they insisted that we spend our Saturday afternoon in Centennial Park at the Center for Civil and Human Rights in Atlanta. Three floors of the museum include personal papers of Dr. Martin Luther King. It includes a timeline of the civil rights movement of the last century. And then there's a floor of walking through human rights issues that continue around the world. The pictures and the sounds grab your interest and your heart as soon as you walk in. And I was turning everywhere over Whelmed, trying to take it all in and our son John Daniel called out to me mom you you got to try this you got to sit here and I turned to watch him pointing to a stool at a replicated Woolworths diner counter and the attendant looked at me she nodded holding out headphones and said without saying do you want to and I nodded yes. Place your hands here. You can stop any time, she said. And I remember that I sit down and I see I'm the only one at the counter. And I can see my face and the shadows of presences of other people reflected in a long mirror that stretches from right to left in front of me. And I put on the headphones over my ears and I sit on the stool and my hands go on this clearly marked spot where hand patterns are on the counter. And the noise starts. It's a busy lunchroom counter and clanking of dishes and voices, voices all around and then yelling starts and it gets louder and the voices are telling me to leave, that I don't belong, that I'm being stubborn, that I don't know what I'm doing. I am called mean names, ugly names, belittling, insulting words. And I know I can leave because I was told I could. But now I'm transported and I feel the strong need to stay. And the voices get stronger and closer, and they're whispering curse words in my right ear, and they sweat, stretch, and switch to my left, and they're close enough for me to feel heavy and hot puffs of breath and threats that I better leave if I know what's good for me, or I'm going to be dragged out. And I believe that could actually happen. My counter stool begins to shake violently and the voices circle from ear to ear and intermittently someone grabs my chair stool to pull it out from underneath me. And the voices get louder and louder and angrier and angrier and I can leave if I want to. But I sit at this point for those who could not leave. I'm transfixed on my own image in the mirror and the words in my head and the palpable anger that swirls around me. And I notice for the first time a timer that's counting up, not down, and I'm unclear about what is being timed and how far it's going to go and how long would the voices circle around me. And it's all so confusing and unfair and confusing in its unfairness and suddenly it's over. And the attending woman at my right 
stands up and I look over at her. You can take the earphones off now, she says. And I was numb. And the timer says one and a half minutes. One minute, 30 seconds. That's how long it took for me to make my oatmeal this morning. And I was exhausted. And I pulled a box, she pulled a box of tissues out from under the counters and handed me one because there were tears running down my face. Holding steadfast to peaceful resistance in the name of freedom is easier said than done. One minute, 30 seconds, that was all. On this Eve's Eve of Independence Day, we have a curious set of scriptures that are ours for consideration this morning. Not about freedom, but about slavery and about family taking up sides against family. And these scriptures leave us with no small amount of discomfort when we hear Paul's words in the letter to Romans putting our day's lesson in terms of what are we slaves to. We don't really like that word slavery. It's a stain on our nation's history and an ongoing problem of culture clashes. It's a way that people control one another and it angers us and it embarrasses us. But Paul is talking about it. To get at the context, we do well to understand that Paul lived in an age, and even says this, where the relationship between slave and master needed no explanation. It was understood and accepted. Today, the word reminds us of 300 years of social sin and evil. And such talk makes us uncomfortable, especially when we are celebrating freedom. But Paul is really driving towards the idea of allegiance and ultimate allegiance and loyalty and obedience and service. To be a slave, as Paul understands it, is to surrender your life to the control of another. We are fiercely independent about our independence. I want what I want. You're not going to tell me what to do, I say. But the truth is, you're enslaved to something. We're all enslaved to something. That's Paul's point. To fashion, to fitness, to food, to a relationship, to your schedule. You're enslaved to the clock, to other people's opinion of you, to a cause, to your bank account, to work, to your health. What occupies your time, your thoughts, your money? We are all making choices to whom we are giving our ultimate allegiance, and Paul sees this really as only two choices. We are obedient to righteousness, or we are obedient to sin. Paul sees nothing wrong with having a master. Everyone has one. It is to whom you serve that makes the difference, and that's what Paul wants us to think about. Whom are you serving? To whom are you obedient 
New Testament scholar David Bartlett describes it this way. There are loyalties that liberate us, that free us. The only way to win is to surrender to God. That's what Paul says. There's an old hymn that goes, Make me a captive, Lord, and then I shall be free. My pastor friend told me of establishing a new church. The church was organized around a kitchen table in a a community where there was no church building with um, eight to ten people. They started around a table. The area was new and it was ready for a church and it began to grow immediately and within a year it was the size of a church to be able to constitute their own charter. And they moved into a storefront and then they moved into a school and finally they built their own building. And as building programs go, there were issues that caused conflict and disagreement, but none so much as the flagpole that was outside the church entrance. The conflict was over which flag should fly on top of the other. There was a group strongly advocating the American flag should fly above the Christian flag. And the pastor tried explaining the theological reasons why the Christian flag should be the highest. And the first group was so adamant that they threatened to leave the church. And the pastor decided not to fight it. It was that strong. If we paid attention to the gospel reading this morning, we have every right to be wondering what Jesus is talking about and whoever approved for Jesus to say that there are times in which he would put father against son, mother against daughter. Why would Jesus threaten to split up the family? For most of us, we think of Jesus as the Jesus who we come to know as the one who comes to bring peace, not a sword, not division. But in Matthew, Jesus is shaking up peace a little. I was counseled throughout all my life and especially in my early adulthood that when I was a guest in someone else's home, I was to be polite to mind my P's and my Q's and not to mention religion or politics. Jesus does both. But Jesus is not saying that he has come to split up the family. But he is saying that his coming and the loyalties of God's kingdom are going to bring tension And they're going to bring struggle even in the closest of our relationships. God will challenge our allegiances. God will shake up the status quo. God wants to be first in our lives. And that will threaten all the other things that have taken first place. But God in charge means... There is nothing to fear. And to give your life away in the name of Jesus is to be given all that makes life free and holy and good. So on this Eve's Eve of celebrating our freedom, Paul asks us what we have freed ourselves from and what we have freed ourselves for. During this past week at Montreat, this was worship and music conference that we went back for. We we took communion every day in in worship with um, 1,100 people. And there was a smaller worship, an early morning prayer 
and um, singing that maybe just about 18 people came to. It's very small. I went a couple of times a week there during the week, and the conference speaker attended that worship. And the preacher was a gifted speaker, big voice, engaging stories. But he used his big voice even in our smaller gatherings. And I admit to it being a little bit irritating. And as we closed that gathering, I became more and more aware of his voice booming through the Lord's Prayer. Thy kingdom come, he said. And then at the end, he says, for thine is the kingdom. And while I was irritated every time, I also heard kingdom. Kingdom bookended and bookends the Lord's Prayer. As Jesus taught his disciples to pray, it was not until the middle of that prayer that Jesus includes anything about our personal needs. Prayer begins with our acknowledging God's kingship in our lives and ends by asking that God make his kingdom here among us amidst all the competing kingdoms. From the very first of that prayer to the last of it, we ask that God's kingdom surround us. And I'm more and more aware that this beloved prayer is a confession of faith. I'm going to close with another reading of Romans 6. The voice of Paul, but this one is from the translation, The Message, which Eugene Peterson, who is a pastor of a church, a very small church, had a Bible study in which, in this small church together, they had a translation for the Bible. Romans 6, 12 through 23, the message. This means you must not give sin a vote in the way you conduct your lives. Don't give it the time of day. Don't even run little errands that are connected with that old way of life. Throw yourselves wholeheartedly and full time, remember you've been raised from the dead, into God's way of doing things. Sin can't tell you how to live. After all, you're not living under that old tyranny any longer. You're living in the freedom of God. So... Since we're out from under the old tyranny, does that mean we can live in any old way we want? Since we're free in the freedom of God, can we do anything that comes to mind? Hardly. You know well enough from your own experience that there are some acts of so-called freedom that destroy freedom. Offer yourselves to sin, for instance, and it's your last free act. But offer yourselves to the ways of God, and the freedom never quits. All your lives, you've let sin tell you what to do. But thank God you started listening to a new master, one whose commands set you free to live openly in his freedom. I'm using this freedom language because it's easy to picture. You can readily recall, can't you, how at one time, the more you did just what you felt like doing, not caring about others, not caring about God, the worse your life became and the less freedom you had. And how much different is it now as you live in God's freedom that your lives are healed and expansive in holiness? 
As long as you did what you felt like doing, ignoring God, you didn't have to bother with right thinking or right living or right anything for that matter. But do you call that a free life? What did you get out of it? Nothing that you're proud of now. Where did it get you? A dead end. But now that you found you don't have to listen to sin tell you what to do and have discovered the delight of listening to God telling you, what a surprise. A whole heal put together life right now with more and more of life on the way. Work hard for sin your whole life and your pension is death. But God's gift is real life, eternal life, delivered by Jesus, our Master. Amen.